Welcome to the Investing Insights Podcast from Morningstar.com. In this week's podcast, we're pleased to present Morningstar's How to Cope with Market Volatility, a collection of content from Morningstar experts. Let's get started. Daniel Needham explains why investors need to see market volatility as a sign of opportunity rather than turmoil. Market volatility is one of the most reliable things that you can predict. You don't know what prices are going to do next month, next year. The one thing we know is that prices are going to move around. And what we see is that prices often move around more than fundamentals, more than the underlying cash flows. And that means at times you have these volatile periods where market prices will fall a lot, where stocks, share prices will fall, uh, and maybe even residential property prices will fall. And often people get scared. People feel the pain of losses more than they enjoy the pleasure of gains. One of the most important things is that you don't overreact and sell stocks when they're down or sell shares when they're down. That's the worst thing that people can do. We think that what you wanna be able to do is be prepared for the periods of market volatility by buying assets that you think are worth more than the price that you're paying for them. At times that means being willing to hold more cash. We view market volatility as an investment opportunity. Warren Buffett always says that he likes his stocks the way he likes his socks on sale. So often market volatility means lower prices. It's a funny thing that in the, in, in the stock market or the share market, people actually want more of something when the price goes up and they want less of something when the price goes down. We think that's exactly the opposite of how you should think about it. So generally when prices fall, it means you're able to buy stocks or shares, fractional ownerships of companies at better prices. We view it as a positive, not a negative. And so we prepare for the volatility by demanding good prices before we invest, and that allows us to have capital or cash available to take advantage of the market opportunity. So it's really important during periods of market volatility that you don't overreact, that you don't sell out your investment at the bottom. That's the worst thing that people can do. Our research shows that those that sell out at the bottom and then buy back in, say, a year later when they feel more comfortable do much worse than those that stay invested. So we think the most important thing is to actually not do anything and to talk to your financial advisor or your financial planner and really stick to the plan. That's what the plan's there for. In the short term, markets are gonna move around a lot and it's very important that you take a long-term approach to investing. Our view is that when we have periods of market volatility or where prices fall, it's often a time where you should be adding more to your investments rather than taking them away. Six days a week, we deliver the latest news for investors. Just say, Alexa, enable the Morningstar skill, or visit Morningstar.com slash Alexa. Now, Christine Benz reveals the exceptions to the hands-off policy for your portfolio. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar.com. Amid ongoing market volatility, investors have probably heard they shouldn't do anything, just hang tight. But is that always the right advice? Joining me to discuss some situations when doing something might actually make sense is Christine Benz. She's Director of Personal Finance at Morningstar. Christine, thanks for joining me today. Susan, it's great to be here. Um, Now the market's fallen quite a bit recently, and um, it's conventional wisdom in these times. We always hear, just hang tight, don't make any changes. And why is that what we hear all the time? (laughs) Well, because it's generally good advice if you've taken the time to create an asset allocation plan that makes sense for you given your life stage. You don't want to be monkeying with it in the midst of market volatility. Chances are you will make some changes that you'll later regret. And then another key concept that we keep talking about and writing about is the distinction between volatility and risk. So for younger investors, yes, volatility is there. We see these ups and downs in the market. Risk is actually messing around with your plan, maybe making it more conservative at an inopportune time, and running the risk of falling short in retirement. So it's really important to understand the difference, understand that as a young investor with many years until retirement, the volatility is your friend, actually. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it, but it truly is your opportunity to sit tight with a stock-heavy portfolio, potentially even add more to that portfolio. We're in the midst of IRA contribution season and what a great time to make new IRA contributions. Mm -hmm. Volatility is your friend for a young investor, even though it doesn't feel like it. So let's talk about some of the exceptions to the rules because there always are some in life. Um, You've said in, in things that you've written and said before that 
often people should should actually think about using volatility as a wake up call to reexamine their portfolios. And um, one group um, that you suggest perhaps do that is young people. What would young people be looking for in their portfolios to possibly do in a volatile market? Well, the key thing is um, young investors can and should be saving for retirement. That's sort of one bucket of money. But also think about other goals that you might have. And my sense is that some young investors have been dabbling in stocks, individual stocks in particular, with maybe short and intermediate mm. term time horizons. They'd gotten lucky prior to this recent volatility yeah. where some of these things had just been rocket ships. But I think it's a wake up call if they do have nearer term uh, goals that they're saving for, they need to de-risk those funds. So if, if it's money that you expect to spend in fewer than 10 years, certainly in the next two to five years, de-risk that money, get it into low yielding, but safer investments. Now, what about investors who are a little older and approaching retirement? You know, again, it's during a volatile market, what should they be thinking about with their portfolios? Right, and the market has adjusted all of our equity exposures mm -hmm. downward, but I do think that people at this life stage should take a look at their total portfolio's asset allocation or get the advice of a financial advisor to help them check up on what they've got. The long-running equity market rally, I think, tended to make us all a little un inert about making <laughs> changes. It was easy sure. to be comfy when everything was going up. We've had a little bit of volatility. So I do think that um, if retirement is within the next five to 10 years for you, think about de-risking your portfolio if you haven't taken any steps to do so in recent years. You can use a target date fund to help guide what might be an appropriate asset allocation given your life stage or really the gold standard for getting a professional read on your asset allocation would be checking in with an advisor. Now, what about investors who um, maybe don't have very aggressive portfolios? Maybe they're a little bit more conservative already. What should they be thinking about right now? This is a surprisingly common portfolio. Yeah. You would think who would be still conservatively positioned, but a lot of investors at various points along the way over the past decade have gotten themselves conservative for one mm -hmm. reason or another. In some cases, it owes to someone having an infusion of cash into their plan, maybe an inheritance, maybe they sold a business. It never quite felt like a good time mm -hmm. to get that chunk of cash invested. I'm not saying it's the perfect time <laughs> to get that cash invested, but investors like that should use the recent volatility as at least an impetus to see, well, how about on a dollar cost averaging plan, if I move this money into the market, how many months would it take? Set up a program for getting those funds invested so that you are in an asset allocation mix that makes sense for you, because even the so having cash and safe investments feels good now as everything's been going down. I think you'll be feeling it if things head back up and they eventually likely will. Right. Christine, thank you so much for your time today. This is great advice. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar.com. Thanks for tuning in. Watch all the Morningstar content you love from your living room. Download the Morningstar Roku channel and get up-to-date independent insights on today's markets. Be comfortable. Be informed. Next, Christine shares how investors can find opportunity during times of uncertainty. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski from Morningstar.com. The recent stock market turbulence hasn't felt very good, but Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance, Christine Benz, has four ideas for how investors can use the downturn to their investing advantage. She's here today with me to discuss them. Christine, thank you for being here. Susan, it's great to be here. Now, one of the things you've talked about quite a bit in the past is that, you know, there are a lot of things that investors can't control during right. turbulent Many. markets. Yes. Most. But one of the things that we can control is how we're contributing and how much we're contributing to our investment accounts. How should we be thinking about that in this type of market? Right. I think that's a really good take control strategy when things are feeling really uncertain. You do control your own savings rate. And so to the extent that you can add to your contributions during these periods of market weakness, 
that actually amplifies your long-term returns. It's uh, what one fund manager said is like, you make your money at times like this, you just don't know it at the time. So if you are in the position to increase your contributions, it's a great time to think about doing it. It's not to say that there won't be more turbulence to come, there very well could be, but by increasing your contributions, you're putting more money to work when stocks are down. That's never a bad thing. Also during times of market turbulence, you recommend that there could be some tax saving strategies that we could be pursuing or thinking about. What are those? Absolutely, so if you have taxable assets, non-tax sheltered assets, take a look at whether some securities that you purchased at a higher price are not selling at a lower price, you can capture that tax loss, use the loss to offset capital gains that you might have on your books, or even up to $3,000 in ordinary income. So take a look at that. If you have tax sheltered assets, traditional IRAs specifically, when the market goes down, that tends to be a better time to convert those traditional IRA assets to Roth because the taxes that you'll owe are based on that lower balance. Mm. So that's another thing to consider. Definitely get some tax advice with either strategy, but those can be a way to kind of make a save uh, in a difficult market. Now, um, you've noted in the past that volatile times are actually a really good time to check up on your asset allocation. But let's say that the market is sort of falling. Is that really a time to tweak our asset allocation? Well, it may be. And so I think what you really want to be thinking about is your time horizon. If you're a younger investor, many years to retirement, probably don't even look at what plan that you've laid unless you were really conservative for some reason. But if you are getting close to retirement, even though the market has come down a little bit, I still think it's a good time to get in there, take a look at your asset allocation, especially if you're within like five to 10 years of retirement, see what your allocation to safe securities looks like. If you haven't done anything, it may be lower than in fact what it should be. And the last point is, you know, the Federal Reserve lowered the Fed funds rate by 50 basis points the other day. And um, while that's bad news for owners of some safe assets right. looking for yield, <laughs> that is good news for borrowers. So what should borrowers be thinking about? A couple of things. If you have a mortgage, you may consider refinancing. You may be able to refinance at a lower rate or even go to a, sh a shorter term mm -hmm. um, where there are typically lower rates available. So check that out if you still have a mortgage. Also. Think about mortgage pay down, so accelerating your mortgage payments, especially if you intend to stay in your home. And the basic reason you'd consider doing that is look at the yields on safe securities. As you said, Susan, they're really low. Your mortgage interest rate is probably higher than that. So retiring your debt may be a better use of your funds. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. These are a lot of great practical things that we can be doing today in this market uncertainty. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar. Thank you for tuning in. Now Christine proposes healthy financial habits for investors to pick up. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar. We've all been hearing about the importance of cultivating and sticking to healthy habits amid the current coronavirus crisis. Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance, Christine Benz, thinks it's a great time to put some healthy financial habits in place too. She's here to discuss that topic with us. Christine, thanks for joining me today. Susan, it's great to be here. Now, Morningstar's Director of um, Behavioral Finance, Steve Wendell, recently wrote about habits um, in general during times like this. What, from your perspective, are the value of habits right now? Well, one of the things that Steve talked about that really resonated with me was this idea of how it really helps your brain at times like this to have habits in place. And the basic idea is that if you have these habits that are so ingrained that you almost forget whether you did them or not, like shutting the garage door, or whatever, these things that you do on autopilot, the positive side effect of having those habits is that it can let your brain focus on the work it really needs to do. And so I think that that can be really valuable with respect to our financial lives. If you have certain habits that you know will lead to good outcomes that you can kind of put on autopilot, you can focus on more value-added financial tasks. So what are some financial habits that maybe we should be thinking about today that can help us down the line? One I've been thinking an awful lot about is this idea of mindful spending. And I started thinking a lot about it with respect to some of these 
fire bloggers, the financial independence retire early people who are big believers by and large in being very deliberate about what you spend your money on. And the good news is um, we're going through this period where we're all sort of in a, a forced reduction in spending, that we're not spending much money apart from food and basic living expenses these days. Some activities that we might otherwise be spending money on have been curtailed. So Jonathan Clements, the financial blogger, was writing recently that he thinks it's really a great time for us all to take stock of which of those expenditures, which of those outings that cost money do we really miss, and which do we not miss so much? Keep tabs on those, think about those when structuring how to deploy your funds in the future, when you are able to pick and choose the activities that you'd like to spend money on. So I would think going along with this idea of mindful spending would be developing a habit of therefore being able to save more. That's right. And certainly not everyone is in a position to save more right now. Some people work in industries that have been directly or indirectly impacted by the crisis, and they may have been laid off or furloughed. They don't have discretionary funds to set aside. But people who still have steady paychecks to rely on should look at whether they can translate the saving they're doing today in, into some sort of automated saving going forward. The best way to do that is to put those savings contributions, those investment contributions on autopilot to commit to an extra $100 a month, an extra $500 a month, whatever you can afford to do to help bump up your savings on an ongoing basis. I've been hearing from colleagues who have bumped up their 401k contributions. It's a terrific way to cultivate good habits going forward. Once people make changes to their 401k plans, whether their savings or their investment choices, oftentimes they just let those decisions ride. And in this case, that can be a really good thing. Now, another habit that you suggest people consider is building policies around their investments and their financial plan. What do you mean by policies? Well, this is the idea of really articulating what you're trying to achieve with your investments. So I'm a big believer in everyone having what's called an investment policy statement where you are enumerating your approach to your investments, your asset allocation plan, notably how often you will revisit that plan and when you'll make changes, what will be the triggers for those changes. That's such a valuable way to enforce discipline in your plan. Many people have a little bit of extra time on their hands these days, so I think it's a great time to think about putting an IPS in place. And we have a template for an investment policy statement on Morningstar.com. For retirees, I like the idea of creating a retirement policy statement where you are spelling out your approach to decumulating your portfolio, how much you'll withdraw from it each year, where you'll go for the cash on an ongoing basis. We have a retirement policy statement template as well. I think that's a healthy habit to get into with respect to your investment plan and your financial plan, because if you've taken the time to create a policy statement, you probably won't override it, and that can lead to health, healthy habits down the line. And the last habit that you suggest we pursue, we pursue right now is maybe a little bit more mundane, but still important, and it's the idea of getting organized. What, what, give us some ideas for how to do that. <laughs> right. We've all been spending more time in our houses, so it's easy to see areas that we know we want to work on, things that we'd like to look better, function better for us. So I'm a big believer in people having an organized approach to their financial lives. It's super easy to let all that paperwork pile up. So it's a great time to create a system that can keep you organized on an ongoing basis. And if your paperwork is organized, and even if it's not physical paperwork, if your financial accounts are organized, I think it just makes it easier to see if you're on track with your financial life. So get in place a plan for what you'll save, where you will turn to your financial providers to supply you with documents and check up on how good their record keeping is. It's just a great time to look at having a total system 
for managing your financial documents on an ongoing basis. An important part of this is creating a system that is understandable to your loved ones. If they need to pick up and run with the plan, for example, or they need to identify important documents, lay all that out where they can find everything. And I like the idea of everyone having what's called a master directory to help show what you've got, where you've got your holdings, and uh, where people can retrieve important documents if they need them. Well, Christine, thank you for your time today and really giving us some practical advice of some money habits that we can start to pursue right now from our very own homes. Thank you, Susan. I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar. Thank you for tuning in. Expand your investing horizons and look to the long view with Morningstar's new podcast, The Long View. Join hosts Christine Benz and Jeff Patak as they talk to influential leaders in investing, advice, and personal finance. Search for and subscribe to The Long View today. And lastly, Christine explains why now isn't the time for grand gestures with your investments. Hi, I'm Susan Jabinski for Morningstar. In the face of concerns about the economic impact of coronavirus, the markets have been churning. Joining me to discuss why she thinks investors should avoid grand gestures and in her words, chicken out, is Christine Betts. Christine is Morningstar's Director of Personal Finance. Christine, thank you for joining me today. Of course, Susan, great to be here. Now, the first question is, what exactly do you mean by chicken out? Should we all be starting to, you know, get conservative and and flee to safety? Absolutely not. So this isn't blanket advice to de-risk your plan. In fact, if you had a well-laid asset allocation plan that made sense for you a couple of months ago, chances are it still does now. Um, But the basic idea is that if you're making any changes to your portfolio, think about doing so gradually rather than taking grand gestures and really uh, upending your plan. So that's really really just another way of, say, diversifying, right? Right. It really is. And I'm a big believer in bringing a healthy dose of humility to managing our financial plans, to really admitting all of what we don't know. And really, that's what you're saying when you build a diversified portfolio. You're saying some of these assets will go up, some of them will go down. Together, they will diversify the risks of one another. And I think you should take that same diversified approach to any timing decisions you might make rather than saying, okay, here's the night where I go all the cash or here's the night where I move all of the money that I had for safe investments into stocks. Really make uh, these decisions more incrementally. I think that time diversification is something that we all need to be considering right now. So let's, let's talk about investors who may have been spooked by, maybe spooked by what's going on in the market. What are some small moves that maybe they should be considering or looking at making right now? Well, if you're feeling defensive, I think it's a good idea to map out a plan to reduce your equity stake, say by a few percentage points during each of the next several months, rather than making a big radical shift to cash. I think many investors, quite realistically, people who are getting close to retirement are perhaps a little overly aggressive in terms of their equity exposure, rather than saying, I'm going to take this all down in one fell swoop, get a plan to do so over a period of months, uh, rather than trying to do it all in one very large shift. And I would take a similar tack with individual stocks and funds that may be performing really badly right now. I think there's a general tendency if you have some of those holdings, and we all do right now if we have diversified portfolios, there's a tendency to just say, I'm cutting this thing. I'm getting out of here altogether. Well, a funny thing happens on these days or in months when the market reverses itself, the things that were the most terrible during the downturn often are the ones that perform best in the future. So avoid all or nothing moves there as well. Think about maybe cutting the position a little bit, perhaps, if it's really causing you discomfort, but um, don't cut it all together because it may be something that you regret that you don't own later on. Now, let's, let's take a look at the opposite type of investor, maybe the one who is seeing this market route as an opportunity. What would you suggest there? 
Yeah, I've been seeing a lot of uh, people saying that they, in fact, think it's a pretty good buying opportunity right now. The thing to remember is that it's really difficult to catch the absolute bottom of the market. Even the likes of Warren Buffett hasn't been able to do it consistently, although he's been directionally close historically. So um, again, if you are inclined to do some buying, put in place a program to move the money in, in smaller increments rather than in one fell swoop. And the same goes for individual positions. You may be looking and kind of licking your chops if you're a value buyer at some parts of the market that have been really hard hit, maybe energy stocks or bank stocks or emerging markets. Maybe take a lighter version of some of those investments. So rather than investing in a bank sector ETF, for example, maybe look at a value fund that gives you more diversified exposure to some of the downtrodden uh, parts of the market. The same goes for um, investing in emerging markets. Rather than looking at an emerging markets value fund, for example, maybe just look at a good value-leaning international fund that will have plenty of exposure to emerging markets. Take more diffuse bets rather than taking those really concentrated bets where you are buying into a holding that's going to give you a lot of volatility on an ongoing basis. Christine, thank you so much for sharing some of these lighter touch ideas for us to pursue during these turbulent times. Thank you, Susan. Good to be here. I'm Susan Jabinski from Morningstar. Thank you for tuning in. That does it for this week's Investing Insights podcast from Morningstar.com. We hope you've enjoyed our program and we welcome your feedback. Please send your comments and questions to podcast at Morningstar.com. From everyone here at Morningstar, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.